This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. SE Radio listeners, we want to hear from you. Please visit se-radio.net slash survey to share a little information about your professional interests and listening habits. It takes less than two minutes to help us continue to make SE Radio even better. Your responses to the survey are completely confidential. That's se-radio.net slash survey. Thanks for your support of the show. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Akshay Manchali. My guest today is Luis Cizé, and we'll talk about Apache TVM. Luis Cizé is the CEO and co-founder of OctoML, a machine learning acceleration platform designed to help developers deploy machine learning models on a variety of hardware, cloud, and edge devices. OctoML was spun out of the University of Washington, where Luis is also a professor. There, Luis and a number of his co-founders created Apache TVM, a deep learning compiler which OctoML is built on. Luis, welcome to the show. Really great to be here. So before we dig into TVM, I want to cover some fundamentals. So just to set the context, can you start off by telling us what Apache TVM is? Apache TVM is a machine learning, deep learning model optimization and compilation package that takes models written in all of the major frameworks of TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, Keras, and so on. It ingests uh, it into its internal representation and does a bunch of optimizations like operator fusion, data layout, it can do quantization, and so on. And then it produces a highly tuned binary for, the, for a specific hardware target. Essentially, subsumes a lot of the manual engineering required today to get your model to be performant and to be ready to be deployed in your platform of choice. And it supports a variety of hardware targets, including mobile CPUs, server CPUs, mobile GPUs, server GPUs, accelerators, FPGAs, and so on. Let's talk a little bit about the models itself. So in the entire life cycle of, say, machine learning from when a data scientist looks at a particular problem, can you describe how they go about building a model and what does the model really entail? What does it contain or represent? Absolutely. And it's also great to make it clear where Apache TVM fits in this end-to-end from data to deployed model, right? So, mm-hmm. so once upon a time, you get data. Right? So data scientists work with a bunch of data. They curate data sets to train the models. There's a lot of data management and, and make sure you have you know, the right data to build your model, to test your model, and so on. And then they find the general model architectures that are for the problem that they are interested in solving, for example, it could be a computer vision, focus architecture, it could be natural language processing, it could be time series predictions. There's a bunch of different categories of architectures that data scientists can consider. And then they use, you know, there's various tools to help identify what is the best initial model. And you would represent that model in a framework like PyTorch or TensorFlow, which are declarative models that you can declare what your model is supposed to do. And then you run a training process. The training process takes this model architecture that you specified in the framework and then ingests the training data and really trains the parameters of your model to make sure that they perform well on the training data and also testing it against your test data set to make sure that the accuracy translates to, to data that was not included in the training set. Okay, so the result of all of that is essentially code that specifies what your model does and a ton of data that are the parameters that represent your model. And as you might have seen in the technical news, the number of parameters and the complexity of the models keeps growing up you know, a lot. You're talking about models with tens of billions of parameters. It's not uncommon, right? Especially the language models have, they're very, very large, right? So this model as a collection of data and code and a bunch of data needs to now run on your deployment hardware, right? So you might want to run it on a mobile phone, run it on a smart camera, on a self-driving car, or you might not run it in the cloud as part of a cloud service, right? So, and, um, or a software service application, right? So that process tends to be pretty labor intensive because typically models are effectively what we call interpreted, right? So there is a, for each, each part of your model, there's a bit of code that hardware vendors have written in the form of libraries. For example, NVIDIA has the CodeDNN library that has bits of code for each part of the model, say, matrix multiplication, convolution, dot products, and so on. These are all, that's a, the execution engine stitches them together as they're evaluating the model. And what Apache TVM does, instead of actually interpreting the model, it produces fresh code, highly optimized for the end of hardware target, right? So 
Do you have a model which is a bunch of code and data and translates that into a binary that runs in your target hardware and so on? Mm-hmm. Let's talk about different kinds of models. A very simple machine learning model that people get introduced to is a linear or a logistic regression mm-hmm. model. And then the more sophisticated ones that you're talking about, say, deep learning that is involved in computer vision and variety of emerging applications is a more complicated model. So can you tell us what is the simple one, what's computationally involved, and what's computationally involved in the more sophisticated ones? It's a great question. And I would say that, yes, there's linear regressions, there's decision trees, which is like, I would say, classical machine learning, right? So, and then there is deep learning and, you know, the more sophisticated models. For logistic regression, support vector machines, and deep learning, for example, in the end, it all boils down to a bunch of linear algebra. You're multiplying matrices, you're multiplying vectors, and so on. And what the difference between a simple model and a complex, and a complex model is really just the amount of linear algebra computation that you do. I want to be clear that even though my core background is not in core machine learning, it's really about machine learning systems, right? So I'll tell you that it's uh, something that people say often is that if there's a simple machine learning model that works well for what you do, that's what you should use, right? You should only pay more complexity and pay more computational cost and more engineering if it actually brings you value in the form of better predictive power and better, more accuracy for the problems that you care about, right? The big difference really fundamentally is just how much computation you're doing underneath, right? With deep learning, you have multiple layers and you have a lot of what we call operators that are stitched together that do convolutions, matrix multiplication, you know, activation functions, and in a in a very complex data flow, let's put it this way. Whereas, you know, a simple logistic regression is just a very, very simple linear algebra computation, right? But then there's another big one here that I want to mention, which decision trees, you know, one example of a package that's pretty common there is XGBoost who happened to have been started by, by our CTO as well, Tian Chi Chen. Actually, Boost is, is essentially the boosted trees models, essentially a collection of, of decision trees that can be evaluated, can be trained to find what are the decision points from training data. It defines the boundaries of the decision points in your in your boosted tree models. And the XGBoost Boost is a package that evaluates these models, right? So that's also part of what people call classical machine learning. It's very important, it's very widely used. And interestingly, From a computational point of view, going deep down, getting closer to how your processor sees it and how you execute that, at a first approximation, would be a bunch of if-then conditions, right? So you can evaluate the decision as a bunch of if-thens, right? So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is also doing it as linear algebra. Now it's sparse linear algebra. You can actually convert these decision trees evaluations as sparse linear algebra evaluation expresses as, as a linear algebra expression. And once you do that, it can actually also run that through a package like TVM that just treats that as if you were regular linear algebra code and then still takes advantage of all the optimizations. I know it was a long answer to your question, but I hope it was useful, you know. So. No, it was. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good overview. Interesting to know about like XC Boost and how it works with decision trees. So one aspect of TVM, I think, is the portability of your models where you can run it on different target architectures. But I think there's another aspect which also involves the performance and the efficiency aspects of it. If I have a simple deep learning model that solves some kind of a problem, where does that efficiency really come from, from specialized hardware? Or why specialized hardware is actually useful for that? Let me answer your question in two parts. First, let's let's ignore specialized hardware. First, let's just talk about specialized code. Where does mm-hmm the optimizations come from and how do they bring performance to a deep learning model on existing typical, say, CPUs and GPUs, right? So where TVM shines is really is doing optimizations like, okay, once you have an operator or you fuse two operators in optimizing your model, they are all, in the end, as I said, a bunch of linear algebra code that gets represented as loops over data and performing operations. Like So when you look at that, there's many things where you can change to get performance. For example, you'd lay out your multidimensional data structures in memory in a way that you make better use of your caches. You make better use of memory by just organizing it in memory in a more convenient way for the hardware. The second thing is picking the right instructions, you know, you're going to pick the right vector instructions, the right scalar instructions. You want to make sure that you keep the data in registers as much as possible. There's a bunch of scheduling decisions that you can make. Other things are in the, what order can you evaluate the loops, right? So for a given deeply nested loop, you can change the order of your loops, have the same computation, but a given loop ordering is much better than another one. So if you do the cross product of all these decisions of data layouts, loop ordering, how you tile the traversal of your data structures, and then the kind of instructions you use, you generate large number of candidates 
per piece of code, right? And picking the right one is one of the things that, you know, TVM does well, okay? So great. So, and then what you get in the end is really code that's highly specialized to that model because that's what, since you specialize to the data layout, to the parameters of your code, you know, you specialize the code. Great. So that's one thing. Now, how do we go further? We go further by making use of specialized hardware, right? So, and the trends today is pretty clear, as you can now see, you keep hearing about more and more AI chips or features in popular hardware engines and, you know, CPUs, GPUs, and new accelerators that are dedicated to deep learning, machine learning in general, that they actually have hardwired circuits that perform an operation in a highly specialized way. For example, a 2D convolution or an 8 by 8 matrix multiplication or a dot product or an activation function like a sigmoid function. So you really hardwire that into your circuits. And when you do that, now I can put my computer architecture hat. Actually, my core mm-hmm. background is in computer architecture, right? So mm-hmm. the efficiency there comes from the following that in a general purpose processor or any general purpose circuit, you're going to have a lot of circuitry that's making decisions of what you should be doing at any given time. Like, should you be doing this or that? Right. So, and then that depends on the code. Well, if you build a hardwired circuit, you don't have to make those decisions. You know exactly what you're going to do. You do only one thing. So you don't spend any circuits. You don't spend any energy or any time figuring out what you should be doing at, at that given time. Right. So that's where fundamentally the specialization comes from is that you remove these unnecessary, you know, condition tests in the hardware. And then you can optimize your circuit. You're going to have shorter wires. You're going to have less memory. And, you know, if you have shorter wires, it's faster, right? So you can more transistors mm-hmm. dedicated to actually useful computation. That's from the harder point of view. But then that specialized unit in your hardware needs to be invoked by your software somehow. So whenever you have a specialized unit, there will be a specialized instruction that typically looks very strange, you know, like this really complicated instruction that you have to invoke somehow. And making use of that, it can either be, you know, a super low level programmer that's going to go and use that assembly instruction right there and know exactly how to use it. Those are rare and we don't want to have to rely on those too much, right? And for too long. Unfortunately, a lot of low level libraries rely on low level assembly code tuning, which is something that, that's where you don't want to be. But the way this works in TVM and other machine learning compilers is that there are ways of actually matching what you're trying to do in your model with the primitive available in the hardware. This problem sounds easy, but it's actually fairly complex because the more complex the operation in hardware, the more difficult is the pattern matching to make sure that you're using the right instruction, right? So mm-hmm. does that give you an overview? Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess something to understand here is the complexity also involved in actually writing that sort of specialized instruction for assembly, right? So how complicated is that for something that's very simple as a linear regression model, which is something that might be more sophisticated with multiple, you know, composed of many, many operators? Let's drill down in one, right? So let's say if you're just doing a simple 8 by 8 matrix multiplication in hardware that you want to invoke. Let's keep Mm -hmm. it super simple, okay? So what do you need to do? Well, that instruction that you invoke with a single primitive in hardware takes a bunch of inputs. You have to know how the hardware expects to see the data in memory and where it expects it to be when you say go, okay? So when you mm-hmm. actually invoke the instruction. And then the output is put in another buffer that you have to go get it from there and put it where you need to go for you to give the input to the next layer. So all of these things, you need to understand what is the data format, where should they be, you know, where is the output, and then also how long does that take to execute because... Remember that it's all about parallelism here. And then whenever you're invoking this instruction, there's some other stuff going on. So you want to know that you're scheduling this right, right? So, you know, when I kick this off, you have another, and I know it's going to take so long for the result to be ready. I can do a bunch of other stuff in between, right? So mm-hmm. does that give you an idea of how complex it Because this can get yeah. just matching the inputs and outputs, but also understanding things of what are the performance implications of using that instruction and what else could be done in parallel, right? So mm-hmm. you would do this with a single target architecture in mind. And I suppose you'd have to do this all over again if you were to change your implementation, change your target architecture, you're redoing all of this. Is that right? Bingo, that's exactly right. So that's one of the reasons why there is major, let's say, vendor lock-in and major reluctance in changing you know, what architecture you're going to deploy your, your model to because making the most out of a harder target for something as performance sensitive as this kind of code involved in machine learning is very very labor intensive. So you definitely want to stick with an architecture for as long as possible, unless you have an automated way of tuning your code to different different architectures so you can move more easily, right? And performance portability is one of the things that we really believe in. And in fact, if, if I may, we care about three Ps here in machine learning. We care about performance, 
portability and productivity, right? You want to make the most out of the hardware that they deploy to, you want to be able to port it, right? So portability to change it to different hardware, and you want to be productive and you want to rely as little as possible on this hard engineering labor of having to tune the low level aspects of your code. Our sponsor for this episode is Spot by NetApp. Spot provides a comprehensive suite of cloud ops tools that make it easy to deliver continuously optimized and reliable infrastructure at the lowest possible cost. Imagine automating your infrastructure to proactively meet the needs of your applications. Imagine leveraging the latest in machine learning and automation to scale your infrastructure using the most efficient mix of instances and pricing models, eliminating the risks of over-provisioning and expensive lock-in. From cost management to infrastructure automation and CD to running serverless Spark on Kubernetes, Spot ensures you maximize your cloud investment. The end result is simply more cloud at less cost. Discover how the most innovative companies, from cloud-native growth machines to forward-thinking enterprises, are automating, simplifying, and optimizing their cloud infrastructures with Spot by NetApp. Check them out at spot.io slash seradio, where you can find more information, request a demo, or give a try by starting a free trial. Let's dig into TVM itself. TVM, in some sense, is a compiler that takes in a model and then gives you target architecture code. Traditionally, compilers have this whole concept of having a front end and a back end where the front end parses and then the back end does the optimization and code generation. So can you talk about what TVM does in that context, like as a classical compiler? Let's say that you have a model in, in TensorFlow. You can also have a model in a generic format called Onyx that has been around for some time and now it keeps getting better and better. So you represent your model in a high-level framework or in something like Onyx, and then TVM ingests it into its first level intermediate representation called Relay. Relay is a typed data flow graph. Okay, so it's an IR intermediate representation that represents your model as a graph where each node is an operator, say a matrix multiplication or a convolution or an activation function and so on. And then the edges, you know, the data transfers are typed. So you know what is the shape of your tensor? What are the dimensions and the data type, right? The dimensions of your tensor, the ranks, and also the data type. What is a tensor? Can you describe that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes we take this for granted. Uh-huh. Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah. A yeah. tensor is a multi-dimension data structure. Think of it as a generalization of a matrix, right? So you could have three dimensions, right? So the matrix is two dimensions, and then a tensor could have a, an arbitrary number of dimensions. Very useful in machine learning because then you can represent many things in each dimension, right? So mm-hmm. tensor think of it as a general abstraction of a linear algebra data item. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So then relay is this data flow graph that's typed. And at that level, TVM can do a bunch of optimizations, right? It can decide to fuse two operators. So let's say that you have a convolution followed by a matrix multiplication. And then you can fuse that into a single more complex operator that can do both of those together. Okay, so those decisions can be done at that level. You can also make decisions like, okay, so for this group of operators, it's better if I run in a CPU. For this group of operators, it's better if I run in a GPU. Or for the other group of operators, it's better if you run in a specialized accelerator. It's a great place for you to do what we call device placement, where these models can get pretty complex and different execution engines in hardware are better for different things, so you can partition where those run. All right, so TVM represents the model at that level, does these high-level optimizations, can do things like quantization as well. By that, I really mean changing the data type. Say if you have a 32-bit floating point number, you might be able to just say, you know what, this might be okay if I did an int 8, go integer with 8 bits. Mm -hmm. You lose dynamic range, but you can still represent what you need with fairly good accuracy, and then you just reduce the computational cost dramatically when you do that, right? So not only go from floating points to fixed points, but you also reduce the number of bits per data item. And then what you do is you actually keep lowering this. This was a data flow graph level. As you lower it down, you're going to lower it to another intermediate representation called the tensor intermediate representation. So that's pure linear algebra expressions. Okay, so you're going to lower from data flow to these linear algebra expressions. And that's where you can actually get bits and pieces of this expression and start figuring out how do you better map that to the available primitives in the target hardware. So at that level, TVM can do a bunch of more hardware-specific optimizations. That's when you do data layout optimizations, when you make selections of what kind of instructions you're going to use. That's where you make selections of what order you do the loops and so on. And that's actually done via a process called auto-tuning, which maybe we can talk about later. But basically, auto-tuning is about generating a large number of candidates and picking what's the best one in that specific hardware by doing a bunch of empirical experiments. And then once you do that, you keep lowering. We say lowering. We lower from the model to data flow graph level to data flow graph 
to a tensor expression, the tensor expression to low level machine code, or sometimes a low level intermediate representation, like for example, a low VM or a lower level IR. Mm -hmm. And what happens with target hardware architectures that don't necessarily expose an instruction, but give you a library? Is the lowest thing translating into the library? That's an excellent question. Yeah. So we use the lowest level API available for your hardware target, right? So for example, NVIDIA GPUs, they do not expose the raw instruction set, right? So we don't know what it is, but we can generate CUDA code, which is essentially the low level API, right? So the level programming interface for that hardware target. It's not quite a library level, but it's really expressing the actual task that you want to do on the hardware. Anyways, and this is, I think it's a good moment to mention that the reason that TVM can do what it does for machine learning, it's because its optimization passes and the intermediate representation preserves enough semantic information about what it is that you're trying to do. I don't want to get you know, annoying and remind you maybe of your compiler classes here, but it's all about how much information is available for your optimization pass. The more you know about what the programmer actually wanted to do, the better optimizations you can do. And the great thing about specializing in a compiler stack to machine learning is that you preserve this intention, the intent that the programmer had, and that enables optimizations that wouldn't be possible if you had to rediscover that from the low level. Mm -hmm. Put another way, for example, I can't just write a machine learning code and say C, that's effectively doing machine learning in a binary and then use that into TVM because you don't really have that semantic information. Exactly, right? If I give you a bunch of assembly code, it'd be very hard for you to discover that, hmm, it looks like you're doing a matrix multiplication. Oh, it looks right. like you're doing a logistic regression, right? So that's hard, right? Mm -hmm. So, and preserving that at a high level enables pretty significant optimizations. So what sort of libraries or model descriptions do you support? Can you describe that landscape of what's available? Like I know PyTorch is one, Onyx is one. So what do these things describe the models as and how do you consume them? I think it's fair to say they're declarative ways of describing your model. You declare what the layers look like. You say, mm -hmm. I have a convolutional layer, you know, I have an activation function, I have a multiplication, I have, you know, you describe what the layers look like and where the inputs go to the outputs. You're effectively describing this data flow graph that relay reconstructs in an abstract way, right? It's effectively what all of them does. In fact, TensorFlow, the name really means TensorFlow. You flow tensors between operators. It's a fairly general concept of declaring a data flow graph and expressing very clearly what is the data type. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the optimizations that you mentioned that TVM can actually perform on your input model. So one thing is you said operator optimizations where you can fuse. So do you have a simple example maybe that people not deep into machine learning can possibly follow or understand what sort of optimizations are actually possible? The highest level one is, is really what we call hyperparameter tuning, right? Essentially, you have parameters in your model, hyperparameters of describes aspects of your architecture that you can tune and optimize for the use case and for the target deployment. So these are outside TVM's domain because the way we think about this is that the model that TVM takes as input is essentially a model that has had its parameter tuned, its parameter like its hyperparameter tuned, and even the parameters all trained for. That's not part of our domain. Our domain is really we treat, TVM treats a, a model as a program to be compiled to a specific hardware target. It doesn't change the model, except for quantization where you change the data type. By and large, TVM does not change your model. And the type of optimizations that it does is what I described before, right? It really finds the way, the best way of how to lay out the data structures in memory for each one of your tensors, right? So it figures out what are the right instructions to use in the, in the, in the hardware target, it figures out in what order you want to execute the loops, and all of that leads to a large space of possibilities that TVM navigates and produces the right, the right code. Did I answer your question, actually? Is that what you're asking here? Yeah, in a way, yeah. Regarding the kind of instructions that you can use, I think people who are writing normal systems programs for channel or CPU, they might be familiar with x86 SIMD instructions, which operates on a vector of, of data. So are there more specialized ones coming out of specialized hardware that you can exploit? Absolutely. So some of them are activation functions that are hardwired, right? So if you have a sigmoid function that you try to represent in software, you can just call it in a specialized hardware might have one that does that in a single, like in one go, right? The other one is convolution, 2D convolution. Some popular convolutions that you tend to express as code with multiple hardware primitives in a typical processor with a series of SIMD instructions you can write, you can execute as a single operator in hardware. That's another one. And then you keep specializing, right? So basically the game here that these AI chip companies are playing is essentially looking at the model architectures, looking what are the popular models want to do, and then hardwiring as much of that as possible as a single big blob that you can call. And this is why it's becoming 
quite of a zoo out there, right? So because the number of species, the number of different primitives available in all the hardware targets, it's, so, it's overwhelmingly large and navigating mm-hmm. that is hard. That's one of the big motivations why we built TVM too, is dealing with this camera and explosion of hardware targets and hardware options and offer a clean abstraction. So is that where the auto-tuning and searching through that space of possible instructions that you can benefit from for your model, is that where it comes from? In part, yes. Yeah. So the auto-tuning is general. It's, it's even for just mm-hmm. CPUs. Suppose that you have a convolution, right? So that you have code for. And now, as I said, there's going to be nested loops. There's going to call some existing hardware primitives, the vector primitives that might be available. And it takes as input some specific data types there, right? Some specific tensors. So now when you do the cross product between data layouts, loop ordering, tiling, and then hardware instruction choices, it's easy to get to you know hundreds of millions, not billions of possibilities, right? So for the same piece of code, all of them are semantically valid. All of them are likely to do, or they should do this, exactly the same thing bit for bit. The question is, how do you pick the fastest one? There might be one that's 100 times faster than the other one, right? So one brute force way of doing that is trying them all. Mm-hmm. But now you might be thinking, I already see you here. Like you might be thinking, well, this, uh, this is going to take a while, right? So imagine this, you're generating a code variant, you are compiling it down, you're running it, you're measuring it and making a decision whether or not that's faster than your previous version, right? So, and then you can pick the fastest one, right? So if, say, if it's in the other billions and then it takes a second to do that, that's a lot of time. It's a lot of computational costs. A billion seconds is a long time, right? So what we do in TVM, and this is not others are, are doing this too, and some of the general technique has been popular in high-performance computing for some time, is to essentially create a very fast and fairly accurate way of predicting whether a given alternative in auto-tuning is actually likely to be good or better than what you had before, right? So given a set of alternatives, can you rank them without having to compile, run, and measure? So the way we do that is by building a machine learning model that predicts performance properties of pieces of code. So given this template that I told you about, and you have this set of parameters you would fill in to go and compile, run, and measure, we extract that as features, we run a few times, and we build a predictive model that says that based on these features of and decisions you're making the code, you know, how can you predict whether or not something's faster, right? So you could try and predict the actual runtime, but that's hard. And you can do that. People have done that to some extent, but I think it's much more interesting to say, given a set of alternatives, tell me which one is likely to be the fastest one without running any of them, just based on their mm-hmm. features. And that's what we do. Like we do this, it's somewhat dependent on the specific code template and the hardware target. And uh, we had a paper about this in NeurIPS, and it's a good chunk of Tian Chi Chen's PhD thesis. He's a former student, a co advised his co-founder and CTO of our company, and also mm-hmm. a professor at Carnegie Mellon University now. It's a really brilliant work that show that you can actually create these predictors fairly accurately and use that to speed up auto-tuning. So how do you use that? Well, these models evaluate, instead of seconds, they can take milliseconds or less. In some cases, you can actually push it down to microseconds. So that means that you make something a million times faster. So now mm-hmm. you can actually get, for all these large returns, you can pick which one should you actually run. Now, instead of actually running a bit, and you can run just a handful, 100, maybe, you know, 50 or 100 in the 100, and then you pick the fastest one, all right? So, and this is fairly accurate. And that's how we do it. So we use that to predict what's the fastest version. And in case you're interested, you know, it's the super interesting question of building these library predictors for pieces of code to specific hardware targets starts to translate to other hardware architectures that are similar enough and other pieces of code that are similar enough. So there's transfer learning opportunities there too. I think I'm missing one aspect. So let's say I I use TVM. I download the library and I feed my model in and I have my target architecture, which might be a GPU or something. And I want to benefit from this auto-tuning capability, but I've never used this before. But also you have a model that kind of predicts which might be good, right? So the way I understand it, sometimes you, you need some training data in order to kind of like say, oh yeah, this is actually faster or this decision is correct. So how do you bootstrap that in just right out of the box? When you install TVM and you want to run it and you use auto-tuning, you have to have a hardware harness. Like you have to have a benchmarking test bed, right? So, and that could be one GPU or one CPU, whatever you're doing. Like you have a few of them to parallelize that. And it runs little experiments to bootstrap that. So it actually starts by running a few experiments and extracts the training data. It trains it, and then it keeps improving the model along the way. Mm-hmm. 
as a quick plug here, if I if I may, so if you use say OctoML SaaS platform, we have that training data just ready to go. Typically we have the models ready to go. And also we have the hardware test bed ready for you to use, both for you know CPUs, GPUs that are available in the cloud, but also you know edge CPUs and GPUs as well. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, you need the target architecture to be able to kind of like let it get better. Yeah. And you have to set it up and you have to measure like, you know, part of the value add here of using the SaaS platform is that you don't have to do anything. It's turnkey, right? You can even invoke the service with two lines of code by our mm-hmm. API. So, SE Radio listeners, we want to hear from you. Please visit se-radio.net slash survey to share a little information about your professional interests and listening habits. It takes less than two minutes to help us continue to make SE Radio even better. Your responses to the survey are completely confidential. That's se-radio.net slash survey. Thanks for your support of the show. We look forward to hearing from you soon. With all of this sort of optimizations, one thing you mentioned earlier was uh, quantization where you might convert, say, floating point ones into integers because they might fit better. So does that change the end result, the accuracy of model? Yes, it does. So the question here is that how do you do that in a way that change it as little as possible, right? So there are many ways of dealing with that. Like one way is to quantize and then retrain it a bit, like refine the training a little bit so you can refine the parameters. That has a cost, you know, it's not ideal. Other things you could do, and we had a paper that Josh from our head of machine learning systems at, at OctoML and also a UW PhD. He wrote a paper at MLSYS that was published last year in MLSYS 2020 that talked about ways of actually estimating accuracy in a local way, right? So essentially you can make decisions just by evaluating portions of your model, not end to end. You can make good decisions about how much you can quantize without affecting the accuracy. We have versions of that and we can evaluate and bound the level of accuracy degradation without having to retrain it. I don't wanna go too deep on the paper. We can talk more about it. It could be a whole other conversation but basically, you can make very local estimations of accuracy degradation with a synthetic input. You don't have real data. So we don't want to be exposed to real data because that's complicated, right? So we can actually estimate accuracy degradation with synthetic data right there for parts of your model. But then what we want to offer the user in the end is that for their data, we want to give them a Pareto curve that says performance gain and accuracy degradation. So you can pick what your level of tolerance is, right? So some people might say, okay, I want to take a you know, 0.1% accuracy degradation if I get at least 2x performance gain, for example. You can make those decisions based on a curve of accuracy degradation versus performance gain. Is that something that you can tune into TVM as an input, or is that just an experimental kind of a thing where you try it out and see where it falls on that curve? You can actually build an outer loop on TVM today. Some people have done that. In fact, we've had papers that show that to show that that's how Riptide, that this paper that you just talked about, did it. And I know that others have built, you know, this outer loop into VM to make those decisions too. So that's very interesting. In terms of actually deploying to the hardware target architecture, you know, that's kind of like towards the end of the machine learning lifecycle to so to speak, right? Are practitioners, you know, data scientists somehow aware of where they're going to deploy it in the end? Is that going to change their decision making about whether they use a certain type of parameter or not? We want data scientists to not have to worry about that. The unfortunate reality today is that data scientists and folks building machine learning models tend to worry about the cost of their models and how they're going to deploy them too early. Like if they know they're going to deploy an GPU because that's what they have available, that's what cost effective, they start affecting their model design decisions too early. And I think that hurts them because they might be making decisions that would, you know, not make them go in a direction that the model would be better, more accurate. And if they had gone that way, at the end, they would have an accurate model and then let things like TVM or TensorRT or other, other optimizers you know, do their job and recoup a lot of performance later. So our vision here is to free data scientists from having to worry about these deployment aspects early on in the model development. We want them to develop the models with their primary goal in mind, which is build the best model that they can with the data that they have in mind. Because today, the reality is that they do the best model with the data they have in mind and some deployment constraints. We want to say, like, remove deployment mm-hmm. constraints, build your best model, and abstract the deployment aspect away and leave that to folks like us that are that do that for a living, right? So Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, if you're a data scientist, you might not have a computer science background, a deep systems background to be able to make those decisions early on. So yeah. it makes sense for them to not worry about that. That's very useful, I think. 
Yeah, you know, that just reminds me of, of this this quote, early optimization is the root of all evil in programming. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, if you, premature optimizations are bad because you increase code complexity and you make harder to maintain. And it's not clear if it pays off because if you do that, it might preclude other optimizations later. We say that in, when writing regular code. And I feel like we're talking about here is a similar thing here in machine learning where, you know, trying to optimize for deployment and the, the process of developing your model early on. Is, is just premature optimization that should not be part of the story, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of like magic happening underneath. If I'm a data scientist that I'm saying, okay, this is the model, and I hand this over to run it in some target architecture, there's a lot of what appears to be just magic before it runs on the target architecture. How do they go about, say, debugging, understanding, you know, whether the model is performing the, the way they actually expected it? Model observability and debugging is a big topic in what is now being called ML ops, you know, parallel to DevOps, mm -hmm. but for machine learning models. Let's start with debugging, right? So part of the debugging, you know, be done in model development, just make sure like your model is misbehaving with some specific class of inputs. A lot of that should be done, you know, if the model was done right, you should have actually had a pretty good representative data sets to test. But sometimes you're just not exposed to that. So what you need to do is just add instrumentation to your model. And then if there are surprises in deployment, you collect those inputs and then you feed this back and then go and refine your model. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. one way of doing that. You put some safeguards to know, hey, your model is, is misbehaving because you have ways of doing some control tests. And then whenever it fails or there's some inputs where, you know, some guardrails are tripped, you know, you collect the data and then you go back to, to model refinement. That's one way of doing it. Other ways is just like doing, we call model explainability which is essentially trying to describe what is it that a machine learning model is doing to a, to a human being that is a domain expert. And then if you eyeball that, you can say like, okay, you know what, let's, let me give you a, an example that's a classic one. If you're gonna make a machine learning model for medical diagnostics, right? So typically this is a black box and it can be very accurate against test sets, but then it could lead to surprises that can be very costly when you're making decisions that, that affect, directly affect human lives in terms of healthcare decisions, right? So what you want there is to be able to abstract that model in a way that it, it can expose to a panel of medical experts that can look at the model. It's like, oh, this decision here doesn't seem right, right? So this model explainability is also a hot topic in AI ML research and is turning into practice today with several emerging companies like Y Labs, for example, works on model observability and model explainability. That makes you understand, you know, not only what your model is doing, but also, you know, how, how is it performing in, in deployment by looking for anomalies and so on. You would have to do that early on rather than in the end, but you can observe what it's yeah. doing in the end, I guess. You do that along the way, right? So it's say mm -hmm. that once you have a model ready to be deployed, what you want to do is add instrumentation to monitor how the model is doing and collect inputs when some unexpected conditions are matched. That's one way. And then the other one is just try to explain, do model explainability. So... Before you deploy it, to explain the model, you just make sure that is it, are there any potential bad scenarios here that aren't being covered or scenarios that are unlikely, but aren't being covered well by the model. So mm -hmm. then you do that with model explainability. TBM and one, in a way, you know, you can run this on multiple target architectures. And what are the reasons? One is like we've discussed about performance mm -hmm. in order to get the best out of your model. But are there other reasons why you would want to run it on different target architectures? Are there other motivations to use this? There's many. One is you might have no choice, right? So let me give an example. You install a bunch of cameras that have local computing in them and you want to do computer vision in them. And, you know, cameras could be installed, like you have a large installed base. You don't have a choice. You have to live with whatever architecture is there. Your model has to run there. So that's one. This is likely to be true for, for self-driving cars and then autonomous vehicles in general, whereas you deploy a fleet of those, it's actually... It takes work for you to go and upgrade the car and you have no choice. If you, want your, if you want a better model to run and make your self-driving car safer and better and so on, you got to live with the architecture that has been deployed. That's one, right? So, mm -hmm. and in that case, and also mobile phones, right? You want to be able to cover as many mobile phones as possible. Say if you are deploying a model to Android phones, there's a large number of chips that are different across Android phones. And you have to live with the collection of the users that you have, right? So... And in that case, one, you want to live with the diversity. And second, you want to make sure that your model is fast enough and uses, has resource requirements that are compatible with how you're going to deploy it. And that's doing optimizations like what TVM does is an enabler, right? So in some mm -hmm. use cases we've had here, it was deployed in a pretty unique but popular architecture that is deployed in cameras. And we offered a 30x better performance. And there was a difference between actually being able to deploy versus not being able to deploy, right? So that's one. The second one 
is when you deploy models in the cloud, you have throughput per dollar constraints, right? If you're mm-hmm. running a model at scale and you're doing, say, tens of millions or maybe hundreds of millions of inferences a day, it adds up pretty quickly, and that can be very, very significant cloud bill. And what's great about that you know, use case is that if you make your model 2x faster, fundamentally you make it 2x cheaper because you use 2x mm-hmm. fewer cloud resources, right? So, And in that case, what you want to do is be able to pick for a given model and a wealth of instances that you can choose from. You want to pick the one that gives you the highest support per dollar. But today, if you have to do manual engineering for each one of those, first of all, you delay time to market too much, right? So because now you have to turn against all these architectures. And then second, sometimes it's not cost effective because you're going to pay engineering time to do that. And it might not be a win in the end because now what are you going to save in deploying with virtual cost is not worth it, right? So being able to move around and deploy into the most cost effective cloud architecture is another another use case. And the third one is even for cloud-based deployments, sometimes latency is a big factor. Right? So let me give you an example. If you're using document analysis or if you're doing and you want to play the document, you want to know immediately whether or not you know there's something you should look at in your model. There's human interactivity, right? Chatbots is another one. You want to you want to be able mm-hmm. to evaluate your language model fast enough, right? So that means that if you have a model that does has better accuracy and leads to a better product experience, but it's too slow to run on the available hardware today, you can ship it, right? So an enabler is when you hit a certain performance target, and then cost savings is because you save costs in the cloud or even save costs in the edge too. If you're building a purpose-built device to monitor something in the field using machine learning, you want to find the cheapest hardware that can do that, right? So instead mm-hmm. of overshooting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, like you said, it's an enabler, and which is why, you know, as consumers, we see machine learning being used in a variety of different ways in our daily basis when we interact with computers and or even outside of it. So voice assistants and things like that. So that's very cool. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the engineering behind DBM itself. Traditionally, compilers are difficult. If you're studying it in school, it's probably the hardest thing that you can study. If you're actually working on it, it's probably the hardest thing that you can work on because there's a certain expectation of like accuracy and correctness that isn't normally expected of other software. Uh, I'm sure most people will go their entire software engineering careers without encountering a compiler bug. So you're building something that is slightly different where you have some amount of like fuzziness in what your programs itself are doing. So how do you go about engineering, building it and testing for correctness? First of all, engineering, I can't pass up the opportunity to say that, you know, TVM is now has a big develop open source developer community. We have more than 570 lifetime contributors to TVM. So it's it's really a huge effort that we're extremely grateful to. And and we and I think that compilers given the the complexity of what it does, but also the diversity of models, frameworks, and hardware target. The cross-product is wide, so the only way we can make the future proof and make that even tractable is by having folks contributing from multiple angles, you know, machine learning engineers to support new models, hardware vendors to support new hardware targets, and folks in the middle, like, to improve and enrich the, the infrastructure, right? So that's just to say, there's a lot of, you know, really talented developers have, have contributed code to it. So, and then how do we deal with correctness? Well, one of the great things about compilers is that despite being complex, right, is that you have very well-defined rules on how you do transformations in your code, right? So you can take a form of verification approach. You know, then folks have talked about formally verifying parts of what TVM does, and that might have happened, and I apologize, I know exactly what part of it might have had that. But by and large, you just do like very, very thorough testing, right? So we have test cases that test, you know, the validity of transformations and in isolation and then ways of showing that they can compose and and so on, right? So we could go and do more and more formal verification, but as you know, formal verification does not scale very well. So you have to do it in a very, very limited way. Mm-hmm. So so it's just, I would say yeah. that, I know it's not like a boring answer, but it boils down <laughs> to the very, very thorough testing and have really good test coverage for correctness and performance regression, right? Mm-hmm. Since you have a variety of hardware targets, are there hardware designers who actually write code for TVM in terms of like actual code generation? One of our co-founders and my former PhD student, Terry Moreau, in fact, part of his thesis was a open source deep learning accelerator. The design is open, by the way, and it's mm-hmm. also part of the TVM overall package called VT, Versatile Tensor Accelerator. And that's one example of hardware software code design, design the architecture with an ISA that gets exposed to TVM. And in that case, Terry, who was the main hardware designer there, there's a lot of others involved, but he was the lead designer. They got involved in essentially finding 
ways of exposing the ISA such that TVM can do its optimizations, right? So that's one example that happened historically. But to answer your question more directly, yes. Yeah, so we do have harder vendors that contribute code directly, and they tend to understand the architecture really well. And that can help, of course, you know, in being able to have the right hooks to enable different types of optimizations in, in TVM. For example, it's no secret that, you know, ARM is a big participant in the TVM community. AMD is a big participant. Qualcomm is a big participant in the TVM community. And we're starting to see other hardware vendors contribute to like Xilinx, for example, and so on. And we see some, you know, folks on NVIDIA attend their conferences as well. And we saw a little bit of commits from them. Some examples of, of course, all the hardware vendors are sensitive to not embedding sensitive IP, but what they're doing is not doing anything as hardwired to that hardware there. So essentially writing the right primitives to be able to doing auto tuning and doing the code transformations be able to support their primitives well. Let's talk about how all of this comes together at a solution level. I'm trying to understand if TVM does something wherein, you know, I deploy a model to a target architecture, but my rest of the program is in, you know, x86, it's running on a server class machine. And then you have these pipelines of data coming in, you know, maybe I'm getting clickstream data from the users, I'm getting something from a database, and you have your specialized hardware, possibly just waiting for something to arrive at it for computation. So at a solution level, how do you, how do you see companies like actually optimizing learning performance and tuning that? TVM produces, as I said, code as output that you have to package, right? So there's many ways you can actually package the C runtime with a well-defined API. But then that goes a little bit outside TVM. That's one of the things that we do at OctoML as part of our solution is to be able to essentially wrap up your model into a variety of packages that make it convenient to deploy. Like you have a Python wheel with Python binding that you can actually call with a well-defined interface, .so library. You know, we can support Windows packaging, for example. We go where the customers want to go. Or a Docker container or a gRPC function that you can deploy and call it as a microservice. And there's many ways in which you can package it. But, you know, at a solution level, what we provide then is this various packaging methods and ways of calling it with just a couple lines of code, right? So you're absolutely right that for this to be a viable solution and actually integrate with the rest of the customer's application, it needs to have the right package and the right API. And that's why we support a variety of those. So. Mm-hmm. Maybe this was something that I should have asked earlier when we were talking about the uh, front end and the back end parts of the compilers. But can someone go in and look at the intermediate representation of TVM coming from a model and then actually hand tune that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, you can actually print out the TVM IR and you can eyeball it and you can you can go and actually make transformations. You can write code directly to TVM IR if you want to. And in fact, some some specialized operators, like one example that we've done not super recently, but I think in the past year or so, was the sparse operator for language models that was written directly in the TVM IR. And it has a bunch of benefits because, you know, you can express things in a more efficient way. Mm-hmm. We love to see scenarios like that. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess it's kind of like not writing machine code, but writing something at a slightly higher level, but still that's closer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's sort of like a slightly higher level, but low level enough for you to express efficient code, right? So Yeah. And I guess you could also use the IR to understand what the TVM's interpretation of your model is. Exactly. And to make sure like, and you also, you have more, more understanding what is it that TVM did to your model, right? So at the mm-hmm. IR level too, which helps you understand where the performance is coming from. It gives you assurance of what it's doing and so on. Yeah. That's very interesting. So where do you see this huge transformation in the machine learning space going, one? And two, where do you see TVM going in the future? First of all, I think it's undeniable that machine learning models and ensembles of models are becoming part of almost every single interesting application that we interact with, right? So from, you know, language models applied in every text that you type to computer vision being done and in video chats to, you know, intelligent user interfaces to code synthesis and then to like just machine learning models just going everywhere and bringing machine learning to the state of where development regular software development is today with the right integration methodologies, CI, CD, optimization, testing, completion, all of this is something that needs to happen. I see this maturity starting to happen. Like, you know, I think as an industry, it's still relatively early, this ML ops flow, but I firmly believe that as machine learning, AI and machine learning in general continues to deliver value and new experiences and applications are going to be an integral part. And then there'll be more maturity there and then there'll be more and more users that would just start integrating this as if you were any other module, right? So that's where I see it going. It's becoming just a natural part in how you build new new applications. 
where I see TVM going in the future is more and more automation and more and more support for these plethora of specialized hardware, right? If you think about it, you know, even though we keep hearing about the AI chips, you know, there are very few that are truly mainstream yet. You know, NVIDIA GPUs arguably has a lot of specialized stuff there. And then AMD GPUs turn, starting to become more and more, and more interesting for machine learning, like in part because TVM is starting to support it pretty well. But you haven't seen any other ones. You haven't seen Graphcore, Cerebras, you know, all of these other ones that are about to hit the market, right? So, and many others that I'm, and Grok and many others that are about to hit there, you know. So we definitely want to see TVM being, you know, again, continue to be the abstraction that you use to not have to worry about how you get your models deployed. And for that, we need to continue improving to make it easier to onboard new hardware targets. We have to continue building more automation to accommodate the front-end extensions and so on. And I see TVM continuing to be established as sort of like this open de facto standard uh, that support all model frameworks and all, all hardware targets that people care about. So mm-hmm. That's actually very interesting in you know, the systems community in general to see this sort of rapid change that's happening through machine learning based motivated examples. Right. Luis, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much. Actually, it was really fantastic chat. Thanks again. I, I really enjoyed this. You're very talented. You know? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, this is Akshay Manchale for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at sc-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.